congratulations. Welcome to the budget committee. Today we are being briefed by the Western Cape Second Adjustment Appropriations Bill. We had the first reading of the bill today as introduced by Minister David Mania. And I would like to welcome you all, as well as all of those from the public who may be watching on YouTube or who may have joined us today. Colleagues, the normal rules apply for the committee. We are live on YouTube and the meeting is being recorded. Should you have a point of order, please use the raise hand function. Or if you do not have the raise hand function, please use the chat to indicate your point of order. If there are any apologies, um, members can table those now. If none, then um, I will start with the introduction of the members and then introduction of the officials as led by the minister and his team. And then we'll jump straight into the presentation on the respective bill. Colleagues, are there any apologies for today? If none, then I would like to request that members introduce themselves, please, for the record. Chairperson, good afternoon. Good morning, Ricardo McKenzie. Thank you, Member McKenzie. Good morning, Chairperson, Wendy Philander. Thank you, Member Philander. Good morning, Lorraine Boota. Thank you, Member Boota. Good morning, Chairperson, Edsel Vogel. Morning, Member Van Vogel. Good morning, Chair Lady, Peter Marie. Morning, Member Marie. Good morning, Mireille Wenger, Alternate Member. Morning, Member Wenger. Good morning, Chairperson, Alternate Member Regan Allen. Morning, Member Allen. Good morning, Chair um, Dalen Mitchell, Alternate Member. Morning, Member Mitchell. Morning, I, think, uh, I think that was Member Lacker, if I'm not mistaken. Correct, Chair. Welcome. Morning, Brett Heron. Welcome, Member Heron. Good morning, Gillian Bosman. Welcome, Member Bosman. Morning, Sir Pat Moran. <laughs> Welcome, Member Maran. Good morning, Derek America, alternate. Welcome, Member America. If those are all the members, okay, and I'm Deirdre Bartman, Chair of the Committee. Minister, um, I know you are in the Chamber. If you would like to introduce your team, please. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. I'm David Mania, Minister of Ec Finance and Economic Opportunities. I'm joined uh, in the chamber by the provincial uh, head official, David Savage, and through him I'll ask uh, members of uh, the provincial treasury to introduce themselves. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson and members. Um, yes, uh, Online, we have a number of senior officials from the Provincial Treasury, uh, led by Dr. Roy Haverman, but if I can hand over to, uh, to them to just introduce themselves very briefly. No problem. If the officials online could just Sorry. introduce themselves. Apologies. Um, I just see a hand um, raised at the moment quickly. Um, Honorable Van der Westhuizen, is that a point of order? No, Chair, I was just a little bit slow to unmute myself earlier. I'm also part of the meeting. No problem. Thank you and welcome. Um, if the Treasury officials can just um, introduce I'm themselves Chair. online quickly, please. Comrade Chair, I was welcome. even slower than Honorable van der Westhuizen, but I'm also in the meeting. No problem. Welcome, Honorable Dagmore. Um, if the Treasury officials can now introduce themselves.
Thank you, Mr. Haverman. And if you'll be speaking in the presentation, I would just advise speaking a little bit closer to the mic as your, your connection's quite soft at the moment. Other um, Treasury officials online? Good morning, Chairperson. Annie Lispect, Public Finance in the Provincial Treasury. Thank you. Going once, going Good morning, twice. Chair. Um, Steve Kenyon, also uh, public finance, local government public finance in the provincial treasury. Chair, you speak in staggered fashion. I can't hear what you're saying. Um, the official, Mr. Stephen Kenyon, was just introducing himself. Um, and welcome. Are you able to hear me now, M Member Mare? I say that we can't, I couldn't hear a thing anybody said. The voice come in drip, drip fashion, no? Uh, you hear one word, silence for five seconds, another word. So I don't know whether somebody's stuttering or whether I'm... Uh, I'm uh, yeah. let's, um, let's see how it goes. If you're able to hear me properly at the moment, then I, then I think that is uh, sorted. And welcome, uh, Mr. Kenyon, and welcome to the provincial government of the Western Cape as well, um, given that you worked at National previously. Are there anyone else? Good morning, Chairperson Lars Langenhoven on the infrastructure side, Treasury. Welcome, Mr. Langenhoven. Morning, Chair Paul Pinar from the Provincial Treasury Business Information and Data Management. Welcome, Mr. Pinar. Going once, going twice. Morning, Chairperson. Chairperson, I just yes. watched. Oh, just as I was about to introduce myself, uh, I don't know what happened. I had network problems, but I'm back. Uh, it's Lula Mamvimbi. Thank, Thank you, you, Member Mvimbi. And um, before I forget, um, just also a, a welcome. I think I have done it before, but a warm welcome to Mr. Haverman, also from, from National Treasury. Seems that the Western Cape government is a, is a very successful province to have so many people from National coming to come and work for us. But with that, thank you for all the introductions. Minister and, um, and I, I think it's working Savage. with us. Chair, I think it's working with us, not for us. If I can just, you know, it's cooperative government. That's what it's called. <laughs> no, you must understand, member. Thank I you so much for raising. Members, we can't all speak together. We can sing together, but we cannot all speak together. And if you have a point of order, please raise your hand function. But thank you for the, in the info on cooperative governance. I always considered that to be a government with another government and not to where employees are working for a particular government. Um, I see a hand from Taryn van Reda. Is that a point of order? Chair, just want to introduce myself, Taryn van der Reder from the Provincial Government Budget Office within the Treasury. Thank you so much. Members, I am going to ask that um, we all just mute ourselves now, just so that we can avoid some background noise. And what I'll do is to assist, I'm going to also just mute all quickly. Perfect. Uh, I've muted all now. Minister, um, in the Chamber and HOD, um, uh, Mr. Savage, you have the floor now. You can jump straight into the presentation and then we'll do questions and after answers afterwards. Thank you so much. I will just put my video up just so that... I, okay, I think the chamber sound is on. That's fine. Okay. And then I'll just put my video off as well just so that we can assist with connectivity um, in the meantime. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I'm going to hand over to the uh, Provincial Treasury Head Official and Team Finance to take the Budget Committee through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you, Minister. Yes, the, the, uh, the Minister had mentioned that the, uh, the Provincial Treasury has been working um, relatively tirelessly on this, um, on this uh, adjustments budget and the medium-term budget policy uh, statements, uh, and so we wanted to take this opportunity to lay out 
a uh, the broader fiscal context and how the adjustments budget and the medium term budget policy statement adjusts to this. We are aware that at the budget um, committee meeting, um, I think it was earlier this week. Uh, yes, on Monday. Uh, we did uh, we did talk specifically around some of the issues, particularly to do with compensation. But given the centrality of that uh, in uh, in the fiscal framework at the moment, we are going to go over some of that material again. Um, and uh, uh, would apologise in advance if we are are boring any of the committee members. Uh, but it, these are complex um, and it, and a very dynamic fiscal situation that we are currently in. The um, the outline of the presentation is really to um, to as I say, present some of the context uh, and the background to the to the second adjustments budget, particularly in terms of the national fiscal framework, and then look at the implications for uh, the Western Cape fiscal framework, our India changes and uh, and changes over the uh, the forthcoming medium term expenditure uh, framework, which is the main budget that we would table in um, in March. Um, the I think that there are. It's only appropriate that I give some cautionary notes, given the complexity and dynamism that's currently in the fiscal framework. The first is uh, for for uh, I think committee members uh, to note that we're dealing with uh, two discrete but interrelated um, uh, fiscal measures here. The first is a second adjustment to the uh, to the um, budget for this year. Um, so members will remember in July, uh, we tabled a first adjusted adjust set of adjustments to the main budget, and we are now tabling a second set of adjustments to the budget for, uh, for expenditure in this financial year. Secondly, we are uh, in the MTBPS outlining the preliminary forward estimates for the next financial year and the two subsequent financial years um, there, thereafter. So it is quite complicated and it's worth bearing that in mind and we're hopefully going to make that clear. The second is, of course, the interrelatedness, is that there are pass-through and carry-over effects uh, particularly related to compensation reductions in terms of how the forward estimates proceed from one, uh, one year into the next. Uh, and we will hopefully make that as well very, very clear so that members are able to fully understand the nature of the effects and the, their underlying drivers. And then finally, of course, as I'm sure members are aware, the, that budgets are a, um, a set of upward and downward revisions to expenditure estimates that reaches a, a net headline uh, figure for budget purposes. Um, the and and these are driven that 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 net outcome is of course driven by all of the above adjustments carry through effects and pass throughs that I referred to. So if I can if I can just proceed in laying out the context to, to remind members, as I said, that we have already adjusted our expenditure estimates for the current 2021 financial year once already. That was tabled in July, and at that point, there was a set of adjustments that amounted to 3.056 billion rands worth of adjustments. Um, that was uh, directly associated with our response to the pandemic and readying our systems um, uh, and, and services to be able to respond while coping with some of the immediately visible effects of the lockdown on our ability to operate in other um, uh, services unrelated to the COVID, um, the, the, uh, the COVID pandemic. And that table on this slide is really just a summary of those, uh, of those adjustments uh, and shifts. We did at the time uh, uh, indicate that there were a number of very significant uncertainties that were, face, that were going to face us for the remainder of this financial year, uh, particularly in, uh, re in our revenue estimates, um, the, in uh, the, uh, the dynamics associated with an, an evolving pandemic, uh, both in, in the public health dimensions of that, as well as in how we were able to resume other critical services, particularly in health and education, and of course the need to support a recovery program for the province 
post the uh, the initial surge in the pandemic, given what were immediately evident as deep economic and social shocks. Since then, some of this has become clearer. Uh, of course, we are facing an environment of significant downside risk, and uh, we are able now to move to a second adjusted budget, uh, as well as uh, outline a medium-term framework with a set of preliminary uh, estimates of forward expenditures over the medium uh, over, over the next three years for the for the province. It is important to realise the depth of the economic shock that has uh, hit South Africa, and that shock has come on the back of a um, sustained uh, structural constraint to growth in South Africa. So we were already, as an economy, underperforming relative to our, our emerging market peers before this crisis, uh, th this crisis hit. When you look at that graph uh, in terms of real GDP growth rates uh, from 1999 to 2019, South Africa is the orange line, and you can see there's a widening uh, gap uh, between South African performance and the average of emerging market peers. And this shows a descent in performance for South Africa. We're not keeping up with growth rates in other emerging market economies. That's indicating really that, they're long, uh, that there are long run structural weaknesses in our economy that are, uh, that, that, that are undermining growth and undermining growth potent potential in the economy. These have been spoken about at length in the past. Uh, the more obvious ones are things like, for example, the, en uh, the energy supply crisis that we, that we face. The, so, but it's important to note that these structural weaknesses are, uh, under, are in addition to uh, and essentially the foundation on which we are now experiencing a cyclical shock from the COVID, uh, uh, the impacts of COVID and the locked, lock, lockdown. So while it's important that there are short-term, short-run counter-cyclical measures, uh, it must be acknowledged that these are going to have limited impact in the uh, in the context of these much deeper uh, structural constraints to to growth in the in the South African economy. Um, in this context. Uh, as well, our national revenue estimates continue to be uh, revised downwards. These uh, numbers on this table are from the National Treasury, and they're showing that since the 2020 main budget was tabled, the national main budget was tabled in February, there has been significant downward revisions for the medium term uh, uh, in, in uh, revenue estimates for national government from our main tax sources, uh, a, a downward revision of 300 and nearly 313 billion rand in the current year, uh, 223 billion uh, in, in the next financial year, and 217 billion rand in the subsequent fi financial year. So there's clearly been an extraordinary shock to economic output in uh, in the current financial year, uh, and that is translating into uh, uh, very severe revenue shortfalls that are going to persist into the medium term. In other words, the economy is not just going to bounce back to where it was at the beginning of this year. Uh, it is only, in fact, estimated to recover to that point over a very long, much longer period of time. The tax to GDP ratio. Um, is 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 projected now to only recover to uh, pre-COVID levels by 2027, 28, uh, and this is the dual effect, obviously, of the sharp contraction, but the deeper declining growth potential of the of the economy. So, what this means, this low growth environment, these sharp revenue and sustained revenue reductions, is that without other measures being taken, a debt crisis. For, uh, uh, for South Africa Incorporated is, uh, is looming. We have, as a country, had one of the largest projected increases in, in public sector debt over the next three years, uh, and our fiscal uh, position is indeed a big risk to our overall growth outlook with higher long-term borrowing costs and 
and risk premiums that are going to start to affect economic activity in the broader uh, in the broader economy. We are now facing, and I think Minister Mboweni as well as Minister Mania were very very clear about this uh, in their respective uh, speeches that our margin for error is extremely limited uh, in our fiscal path. There are significant downside risks that are facing us, and the probability of some form of default on public sector debt is now at an all-time high. Um, we have to arrest this debt, debt trajectory, um, and uh, if we don't, we can start. To, we we are we will definitely start to see um, debt servicing costs consuming a very significant portion of uh, main budget revenue by 2024-25, uh, probably at the latest. The underlying driver of all of this is has been relatively unconstrained growth in public sector compensation costs, which has begun to crowd out other expenditures uh, uh, by the by the public sector. Um, these uh, two graphs show you compensation of uh, em employees indexed 2009. Um, the, and one can see on the left-hand side compensation of, of, of employees as a percentage of GDP has continued to rise, in fact rising quite significantly uh, over the, in the current wage agreement, um, and that has compressed other areas of government expenditure. So our past efforts in the public sector to contain expenditure in other areas without reducing um, uh, the, the, the rate of growth of compensation expenditures have really not managed to allow South Africa to avoid this um, emerging crisis. As a result, uh, uh, National Treasury has now set out a consolidation path in their first supplementary budget uh, that they tabled in June. They set out a three-year fiscal framework for debt stabilization. That has now been adjusted to a five-year uh, program for, uh, um, for, for debt stabilization, stabilizing at 93.3% of GDP. Uh, so slightly less ambitious than the active scenario that they had previously outlined. At the core of this strategy for debt consolidation is a focused effort to significantly reduce public sector wage costs, thereby shifting the composition of total public expenditures and ensuring that expenditure, other, other forms of expenditure um, can start to resume their growth once the adjustment uh, have, has, uh, has occurred. Um, as uh, Minister Mania has, has mentioned, uh, there have also been across the board reductions in this financial year, uh, particularly specifically for um, the uh, business rescue costs associated with South African Airways. Um, and that has affected our conditional grants, as well as, of course, those of other provinces and local government and of national government uh, departments. What is very clear in all of this, uh, in, in this debt consolidation, uh, debt stabilization um, uh, uh, strategy, is that reductions are going to fall very heavily on, uh, on provincial governments. We are going to absorb a large share of, uh, of, of these uh, downward revisions, uh, the baseline uh, expenditure levels for the next uh, two financial years will be 5 and 10 percent respectively lower than what was indicated at, uh, at the start of this financial year. Um, and they're going to, and this is likely to have significant impacts on provincial budgets as a whole, not, not just on the compensation side, but it is also not allowing for inflationary growth in expenditure requirements that is driven by inflation in costs, the prices of goods and services, but also the growth in the general population and particularly the school going age uh, population. So in summary, from the, the, the economic and, and, and fiscal outlook, a sharp contraction is, uh, is is underway in the in the national economy. Um, there is a bounce back effect uh, of 3.3% growth projected for next year. That of course is off 
a much lower baseline uh, than what was uh, that what we started the year with um, because of that 7.8 percent contraction that is currently uh, underway. The Western Cape economy is uh, is is projected uh, to do slightly better, uh, a slightly uh, a slightly smaller contraction, however, still dramatic, uh, and a slightly uh, better bounce back, uh, although again off a very low base. Tax revenues at a national level are forecast to be 312.8 billion rand lower than projected at the beginning of the year in terms, and that's in this uh, in this financial year. Gross national debt is rising from 63.3% of GDP to uh, nearly 82% of GDP in the current year. This is this is dramatic. Um, and uh, and I think that obviously credit rating agencies uh, have most recently revised their own ratings for South Africa, downgrading us yet again um, uh, in in reaction uh, to this. And as I think as Dr. Haverman has had had mentioned in our in our previous discussion in the budget committee, these are these are not lead, leading indicators; they're lagging indicators. The ratings they are really they're re really just reflecting what is actually happening uh, in the economy, rather than um, the uh, 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 driving the uh, driving the decline. Fiscal measures that now have to be adopted have to narrow this budget deficit, stabilize debt over the next five years to return our public finances to a sustainable uh, sustainable position. That's going to require large reduction in non-interest spending, amounting to about 300 billion relative to the projections that were set out in the 2020 budget uh, review. And the majority of these reductions uh, are going, now going to be applied to compensation to the wage bill. And that, I think, comes with very significant uh, uh, risks uh, should it not proceed as planned, but also benefits in terms of being able to alter composition of expenditures uh, um, and focus on, 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 on uh, service delivery uh, going, going forward. With that, I will hand over to Dr. Haverman to talk through the implications of the Western Cape for the Western Cape fiscal framework, and uh, his team will come in to talk through some of the specifics related to the medium-term budget policy statement, the second adjustments budget, and some of the implications for infrastructure and our municipalities. And I'll come back to conclude at the end. Over to you, Dr. Haverman. I think you'll have to speak up quite a bit. Uh, thank you very much, HOT. I hope you can hear me now. That's Basically, better. I can hear you. Thank there, you. Excellent. Um, there are uh, a, a number of complex dynamics going on at the moment. Um, there's really a lot going on in terms of the changes to the numbers. And when we get to the details, uh, we'll show how those uh, all come together. Essentially, these are the big, big areas. So there are changes to the provincial equitable share. Um, there are increases in the provincial equitable share for demographic shifts. Um, as the members will know, the Western Cape is a relatively fast growing province, both in terms of um, uh, population, school aged children and um, economics. And so that does uh, mean that the provincial equitable share increases uh, over time. There are, however, compensation reductions and this is I would say one of the things I was thinking of doing, if I had the interest in the time, I mean, is to approach the city to open. I'm just going to mute all at the moment so that we don't have any background noise, please, so that Dr. Haverman is able to assist us. Dr. Haverman, you may continue. Thank you very much. Um, so then uh, there are obviously compensation adjustments, which is the core of the national strategy over the next five years. These are basically just adjusting the allocations to the province for the compensation, uh, revised compensation projections. So National Treasury has now put forward compensation calculations based on a wage freeze in this financial year and also a wage freeze going forward. And we'll show how that works. And then non-compensation adjustments related to both inflation and policy cuts 
there are changes to conditional grants. Uh, not all of these have come through yet, um, so they're positive, negative, and unknown. Gambling taxes for us are most uncertain. Uh, there has been a slight increase in, in gambling revenue again after the lockdown, but of course, um, depending on what happens, uh, there might be a change on that side. We also get some of our revenue from things like motor vehicle license fees. That will also obviously depend on, on the economy. Um, and so there are also uncertainties around the national fiscal path. Um, I think the minister mentioned in his speech, as did uh, the head of treasury, uh, the issue around legal action in the wage negotiations, uh, prospect of a debt crisis, uh, recovery and growth and recovery and growth assumptions. So these are all the things that we've tried to take into account, both in the adjustments budget, so that's the budget that adjusts spending for this financial year, and also in our preliminary um, projections for spending over the next three years. So on the following slide, I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail around uh, the um, compensation uh, adjustments, uh, around the provincial equitable share adjustments, and just show how they all come together. So in the um, previous MTF allocation letter um, to the province, the provincial equitable share was 59, 63, and 66 um, in 21, 22, and 23. So it's 59 billion, 63 billion, and 66 billion. At the very bottom, you'll see the new numbers, which are 53 billion, 54.6, and 55.1 billion. The difference is, of course, uh, related mainly to the compensation that has been taken out of the provincial equitable share and has assumed a freeze in, in uh, wages. And then, as I said, there have been additions which is 403, 425, and 842, that's on the second line. So basically, if you take the additions and then you take away the reductions, the net reduction to the baseline on the provincial equitable share is 5.8, 8.5, and 10.8. Um, I cannot overestimate how much of this is related to the freeze of compensation. And so on the following slide, um, we've tried to tease out the, the various effects of how this compensation adjustment is calculated. Basically, you have to think about it as being two wage agreements. Dr. Hoverman, um, if you can just hold on for me, please. Member Murray, you had a point of order. Yes, uh, please, thank you, Chair, lady. I don't. I never saw any slides coming on my screen. I don't know if the other members get it, but I just see the same slide since he started already, and it doesn't change on my screen. I don't know if this is a technical error or what. I just wanted to inquire or whether he's speaking at. The Thank you, Member Mare. Um, I've been seeing the slides change. I'm currently on slide 16, which I see. Okay, what I'm first going to ask is I'm going to ask in the chamber, do members in the chamber see the slides? Are you also on slide 16? Uh, Chair, I can confirm we are on slide 16 and we can see the uh, slides change as uh, Dr. Roy Harverman moves through the presentation. Okay, now members online. Um, is there any member, just hold on quickly, member Mare. Is there any other member other than Member Murray that is not able to see the slides moving online and see it on slide 16? Chairperson, Chair, my I'm, slides are moving. Is Member Brankes? Chairperson, I'm covered my side as well, and it could be due to um, low bandwidth from Member Murray's side. Okay. Member Murray, um, our IT um, is also on the line. I'm going to ask um, if the procedural officer and the IT officer can just get in touch with Member Mare because it might be a, a problem on your side, Member Mare, as it seems that everyone else is able to see the slides move. And we all seem to be on slide 16 at the moment. Alternatively, Member Mare, um, in the beginning of the meeting, we have also confirmed that we've already received the slides via email. Um, from our procedural officer. 
So in the meantime, while we sort out your particular uh, concern, perhaps we can, um, can ask that you follow us along on slide 16 from the email. Would that be an order, Member Mare? Okay, uh, thank you so much, Chair Lady. I see it's come on now. The bo boogeyman is gone. I see slide 16. Western Cape preliminary compensation estimates. I and that's for the first time I see a slide now, but thank you very much. No problem. Thank you for that. Um, in the age of COVID and being more online now and more digital, um, we will um, have some technicalities. And I, I hope that we all just be with them as well. Thank you so much. Dr. Averman, you may continue. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, just to, to emphasize that, as I was saying, there are two wage agreements. Um, there is one related to the um, 2018, so there was the wage agreement previously. The third year of that wage agreement, that's this current fiscal year, that uh, the national government has decided to freeze wages in the current financial year. So the number related to that is that one there in the grey under 2020-21 of minus 2396103, and that relates to the current wage agreement, and that you deduct from the um, compensation budget in this financial year. So that's the 39659666. And that leaves you with a, comp a cost of employment budget in this financial year of 37.263563. Now that creates a structurally lower compensation amount um, and that feeds through throughout the next um, three um, fiscal years, so over the MTF. So that's the one component of the cut. The second component is that over and above that there are additional cost of employment reductions that relate to uh, that have also been announced over the MTF, and those are in the second line of 17335127. And so the net effect is that the compensation budget essentially stays roughly flat uh, over the entire MTF. So I don't think we need to go into all the complexities of how these calculations are made, but I think what the members should just take away from this slide is that the, compens the amount of compensation uh, that we are paying over the next uh, number of fiscal years is essentially frozen at around th between 36 and 37 billion. Um, and you can see there that that is the orange component of the graph at the bottom, showing that actually compensation is basically frozen uh, over the MTF. And the blue is what was previously um, expected, which is that compensation would rise, um, but now it's frozen. Um, there are obviously lots of risks around that, um, particularly around the wage negotiations. And so we are working quite closely with our colleagues in the national to understand how that would, would take place. Um, back leads me to the discussion around the budgetary and service delivery risks. I think we've covered many of the ones there already, um, and I think we've done these in presentations previously to the committee. Uh, the most important one there being obviously deterioration in the fiscal environment. Uh, the second component is obviously that we need to think very hard about the implications of a reduced fiscal envelope. And as you know, uh, there's an increasing teacher learning ratio there are issues around uh, making sure that our schools and our hospitals are up to standards and meet the infrastructure norms and standards. Uh, we need to increase access to and quality of public health services, and we need to adequately provide social services and support to vulnerable groups. Uh, so this really is the balancing act that the MTUPS and the budget tries to achieve. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Taran van Rueda, to talk a little bit about how we thought through how the Western Cape government could respond and the work that we've been doing uh, on designing the strategy going forward. Uh, thank you, Dr. Haberman. Next slide, please. So, Chairperson, this slide just provides us with an overview of the Western Cape fiscal strategy 
which was basically approved to inform our overall fiscal approach. So the fiscal strategy is divided into three key elements, the one being a balanced budget in terms of balancing expenditure and revenue, which becomes really important now given the fact that we have reduced budget. Um, expenditure is really about how do we optimize our expenditure composition for greater impact, and then revenue is about optimizing our own revenue collection, but also the revenue that we receive from national. So overall, the fiscal strategy is also underpinned by our key principles, which includes fiscal consolidation, allocative efficiency, fiscal sustainability, and fiscal discipline. So collectively, all of these together is really about how do we best manage the reduction to our baselines, while at the same time giving effect to service delivery and also maintaining sustainability over the medium to long term. So this slide just provides you with a brief overview of the budget spending plans and priorities over the 2021 MTIF and really aims to give effect to our Western Cape recovery plan, which includes job safety and well-being, but as the overarching objective of really enabling the citizens of the Western Cape to live dignified lives. So in terms of jobs, this is led by the Department of Economic Development and Tourism, as well as Transport and Public Works. And here they're really looking at how do we enable the private sector to create jobs, but also focusing on public employment program. Other key elements includes um, scale up of work opportunities and skill development, boosting infrastructure and um, as well as boosting investment and exports, and then also strengthening how we do the ease of doing business and red tape deduction. Then with regards to safety, this is really around the implementation of our safety plan and also taking a data-led approach to implementation. And this is led by our Department of Community Safety as well as Health. Then thirdly, we have Wellbeing that is led by um, the Department of Cultural Affairs and Sport and Social Development. But here you will also see strong elements of health and education coming through through innovative healthcare, as well as improved learner outcomes. And we're also continuing to implement our e-learning strategy. So in addition to job safety and well-being, we're also focusing on our COVID-19 preparedness, which is really about um, how we prepare for the possibility of a second wave, as well as containing the spread of COVID-19, which is quite important given our recent statistics in the Western Cape. And then lastly, all of these policy priorities will essentially be enabled through our new way of work, which focuses on streamlining and modernizing government capabilities through data and evidence, digitization, as well as partnerships. So then just lastly from my side is our transversal response, which is really about how do we do things differently in the Western Cape over the medium term, given the current context and our need for fiscal sustainability. So I'll just touch on a few here. Um, we firstly have infrastructure investment and development, which is really looking at how we strengthen infrastructure planning as well as delivery but also how we identify those bankable infrastructure projects, and then also looking at alternative mechanisms for financing infrastructure going forward. Vulnerable municipalities is really about how we better support our vulnerable municipalities, particularly from a financial perspective. We have the compensation of employees strategy that is being developed by the Department of the Premier in partnership with the Provincial Treasury. So here yeah, it's not just about how we manage the reduction in the COE budget, but also how we optimize the use of our staff and also build a better culture overall. Um, the provincial treasury is also um, currently doing a public entity review, which is really looking at how we strengthen the operations, but also the governance of our public entities um, with regards to public participation. It's also about how we strengthen our engagement with the public as part of the budget process going forward. And then supply chain management is also about effective and efficient procurement planning, how we use technology and data as the key lever, and then also how we support local businesses in the Western Cape, as well as the broader South Africa in terms of SEM practices. Um, thank you, Chair. I will now hand over to Ms. Annelise Pick. Thank you, Ms. Van Riede. Thank you, Chair. From our side, it's now to remind ourselves the 2020 budget and responding in year. We always indicated from the beginning that there's a three phased approach in terms of responding 
in year and changing the approach of the 2020 budget. Our first phase was the first adjustments budget and to in order to respond immediately to COVID-19, which led us to the first adjustments budget. The second page, phase, which is in the, the current phase we're in and concluding the, the, the short term phase is about number one, we needed to make sure that we are establishing our fiscal targets by the information that we are learning um, from a day-to-day -day basis, from both from an economic and as well a fiscal outlook coming from the National Treasury. Then also in terms of repositioning those budgets in line with those fiscal targets, it's responding from policy priorities in the immediate phase, therefore in this adjustments budget, and then finally, to make sure that we maintain our fiscal sustainability both in year and over the MTEF, which in the in year, the adjustments budget takes care of over the sustain over the MTEF is where the medium term budget policy then then takes the lead. But all in all, this phase is really about us preparing ourselves for those tough decisions that we're going to have to make in the third phase of our of our, our budget approach. And that is about the, the policy trade-offs, about responding to our policy, um, our service delivery risks, as Dr. Haverman uh, uh, indicated to us. And so in this current this phase, what we are doing is responding immediately from a, to for the Western Cape recovery plan in the adjustments budget. And then in terms of setting ourselves up in terms of having a fiscal framework, an understanding of our future fiscal framework to make those tough decisions. So when we look at the India now and the adjustments budget only, what is the adjustments budget then responding to? Expenditure as of the 30th of September for the for for us as a province, we were spend we spent about an average of 44% um, of our budget. Our votes at this stage were also indicating about the 700, and milli 700 million rand um, underspending, and that is mainly due to the impact of COVID having on still certain of our service delivery programs. And then also in terms of um, a pressure shown in agriculture, um, and that is funding that we have received from national, and that is drought funding that we've already received um, that has not been taken up as of the 30th of September, but is taken up in this adjustments budget. So all in all, the second adjustments budget then does respond to um, where votes found itself as at the 30th of September in the current spending patterns. So moving along then to the actual adjustments budget, the aim of the adjustments budget therefore is in terms of to firstly build on the main budget, to take into account this, the first adjustments budget, as I said, it was our immediate response to the pandemic. And then now in terms of the second adjustments, we're now enabling reprioritization and additional funding to support the Western Cape Recovery Plan for job safety and well-being. We're also in the adjustments budget um, aiming to have fiscal st sustainability in year, but also to set a base for the fiscal consolidation for the 2021 MTF, and as those reductions um, that is also already mentioned um, in the in the presentation. Then, lastly, it's enabled the Western Cape Governor then also to continue to respond to COVID-19. Then, when we look at the principles in the next slide, we look at the principles that have been set in the second adjustments budget for sustainability. It is about managing, therefore, our compensation of employees. The reductions in terms of the 2018 wage agreement indicated by the National Treasury, but also that we allow for departments to create future efficiencies and encourage departments co to contain and reduce the compensation of employees in the current financial year. We're also then reassessing the departmental provincial tax receipts, because if you remember when we started out the presentation, we indicated in the first adjustments budget that we did not take any reductions into our, of our tax receipts into account, and therefore we have to do so in this adjustments budget. We limited rollover and revenue retention to ensure that we kept the base as tight as possible um, and as little as possible to prepare for the reduced allocations coming in the MTEF, but also to make sure that we, 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 
we also ensure that we actually try and has a, some funding left set aside at the end of this adjustment budget period. For fiscal consolidation, um, we looked at any further savings and cost containment um, due to the impact of COVID on departments. Um, we allow also for a revision of any allocations for COVID-19 that we made in the first adjustments budget, and then also a revision on earmarked allocations. Um, this adjustments budget also then, as I indicated, is a response an immediate response for our Western Cape recovery plan in terms of our three focus areas. The next slide shows us the financing of this adjustments budget and how the, the, the funding is made up of. So in the smaller table on our right hand side, it's first looking at our equitable share. So when we started out our, our budget process, we started out with, a, with an equitable share baseline of 55.2 billion rand. National then has reduced our compensation of employees um, in order to, to reduce and respond, um, as indicated in the, in the presentation before, um, to the public debt uh, strategy and reducing our compensation in year by 2.4 billion rand. We received food relief funding for Department of Social Development of 51 million as well, in terms of our presidential employment initiative for education in the for equitable share of 814 million rand. But all in all, our equitable share decreases in year from 55,2 to 53,7 uh, uh, billion rand. So the impact then of this reduction, our equitable share, what does that then do um, for our departments and our allocations that we've made previously? So you'll see then in terms on, on the left hand side in the table, it's indicating that we're reducing um, our, our fiscal framework in year by 2,4 billion rand for the COE reduction. However, as indicated to the committee previously um, with regarding the Dora Amendment Bill, we were not able to find in our compensation of employees budget the full 2,4 billion rand. And therefore, from our reserves, we now need to fund the shortfall of about 538 million rand. We also indicated to the committee that we are in conversations with National Treasury about the calculation, and we are also in terms of getting understanding in terms of why provinces have a shortfall in the calculation that National has made. So what we were then able to, to be able to find from our compensation of employees budgets in the different departments is a reduction and compensation of employees of departments budgets of 1,8 billion rand. Our equitable share in terms of a net increase is a 865 million rand that I've indicated to you is for education, for presidential employment initiative, as well as for food relief makes up your 865 million. We have then also a net increase on national conditional grants of about 82 million rand. Our policy-based funding, and this is now our first response to the Western Cape Recovery Plan for jobs, well-being, and safety to the value of 273 million rand. The breakdown is still to come. Our provincial revenue fund is also making funding available of 42 million rand, and that is mainly in terms of our Conradi Better Living model of 25 million rand. Total rollover amounts to about 67 million rand of the previous financial year. In terms of the over collection of the previous financial year, there's about 23 million rand that has been allocated to departments. And then in year, as I indicated, one of the objectives of this adjustments budget is to look at your the current tax receipts or own revenue that departments um, have been budgeting for. And there's a reduction of those of those own, re own revenue, mainly because of COVID, and that is due to reduction in our motor vehicle license fees that we are expecting, as well as a reduction on the hospital patient fees um, to the value of 197 million rand. Then uh, departments are also um, re returning to the provincial revenue fund, and this is mostly within the transport and public works department, about 400 million rand for um, Q&I, 200 million for reallocation into next financial year on some roads projects of 155 million rand. And then also in terms of the child youth 
and safety um, facilities in terms of 45 million rand um, that they are returning to the provincial revenue fund, all for reallocation into next year's budget. These, this is mainly in terms of the impact that COVID has had on some of our infrastructure projects, but also in terms of the, the current response for Q&I or requirement for Q&I is not the total value required in the current financial year um, for the province, but it is set aside for next year as a response still for COVID. That then brings us to a total reduction of 1.2 billion rand in this adjustments budget. And we are increasing our direct charges to the value of 6.3 million rand and that is in terms of gratuities for members that have not returned to this parliament, but it's still members who then left the previous parliament and it's gratuities that is owed to them. That makes us a total, um, including direct charges then, of 1.2.3 um, billion rand. The next slide. Then gives us now a bit more detail, as I said, the come would be the detail of the 273 million rand allocation from a policy-based funding facility that we made available. And this policy-based funding is really our first response to the Western Cape recovery plan. And uh, we have then, as well as in terms of the, the Premier's October special address, and uh, this funding in the adjustments budget then responds to that. Yeah, in terms of our process that we followed, um, all the leads of the heads of department were asked for proposals from a technical technical perspective. We looked at the readiness to implement, obviously the ability to spend, and then the capacity to implement. Um, and then alongside in terms of alignment, we looked at the recovery, alignment to the recovery plan overall, as well as whether there is a credible theory of change built into the, the thinking behind the project. Um, we then also did this jointly with the Department of the Premier to assess the pro proposals and make recommendations. On the next slide, it gives you then the division and also the allocations then for jobs, for safety and well-being in the adjustments budget. And this is our immediate response. This slide also then divides each of those responses from the funding from a national perspective as well as from a provincial perspective. So when we look at jobs, you'll see then from the national perspective, we had an increase in the roads maintenance grant as well as assistance into the education sector, um, amounting to 61 million rand and 814 million rand. From the provincial side, um, there's a 12 million allocation to small businesses, 145 million for infrastructure and maintenance for school facilities and fencing. And then in terms of public employment, we're looking at 26.2 million, both within agriculture and the Department of Cultural Affairs and Sport. That then gives us in terms of a total of about 1 billion rand towards jobs from additional funding in the adjustments budget. From a safety perspective, there's 80 million rand that is allocated towards safety, it's towards a data center as well as hospital emergency center tracking information system um, for the Department of Health. Looking at in terms of the Department of Community Safety, there is in terms of area-based teams, peace officers, as well as safety ambassadors for community safety. And then in terms of fencing then for the Department of Education and looking at in terms of um, accelerating that fencing programs within schools. When we look at well-being, the total there for the entire um, allocation for adjustments budget from national and provincial allows amount to 142 million rand. ECD is uh, 53 million um, to nursing, 29 million rand. Food relief, 51 million rand. And then about 9 million rand for staff mental wellness in health and then also then towards youth service in the Department of Cultural Affairs and Sport. In total, from a provincial side, that makes up the 273 million rand that you saw in the previous slide. Now, when we look at in terms of preparedness for COVID-19 um, for COVID in the current financial year, we need to remember this builds on the allocations we made in the first adjustments budget. And so for the Department of Health, 
Um, there's a for the data center, there's 5 million rand allocation, and we know that this is so important for COVID-19. The, the, the amount of data we have then influence the kind of decision and also our response that we can make um, towards um, the pandemic. There's also then staying capacity within the Department of Health. This is the 1 billion rand that we made an allocation in the first adjustments budget. In their baseline is still 227 million rand available by the end of October. And we also need to remind ourselves that that would exclude the inventory that they would have on hand. Department of Transport and Public Works then currently has in their base 200 million rand to respond to QNI and then also 200 million rand in the next financial year to respond to QNI. Further uh, preparedness for COVID-19 is in terms of reserves that we have available of 864 million rand, but we need to remind the committee that this 864 million rand is also um, what we would need pending then the outcome of a court case, and we do not receive funding from national in terms of the cost of the, the cost of living adjustments in the current year. We would need that funding also then to respond um, to that cost that we would incur. The next slide then shows us then in the adjustments budget what that allocations then look like for each of the departments. So you'll see right at the bottom, it's the 1,2 billion rand, um, as I indicated to you in terms of um, a reduction to allocations. Um, and then in terms of most of the departments or the votes you are seeing has reduced baseline reductions, mainly because of the impact of the reduction of compensation of employees. And that where there is positive is either because of our policy-based funding for jobs, well-being, and safety, and then also um, in terms of funding that we've received from National for the President's uh, Employment Initiative. Moving along to the next slide, then shows you those total, the same allocations of 1.2 billion rand, how that is then divided, um, that has a combination of our policy-based funding allocations and any other allocations such as rollover that we would have made, but it could be towards jobs. For example, the rollover mostly that we have indicated is for infrastructure, and therefore that would have an impact of jobs. So you can see then how the 1.2 billion rand is in focus towards jobs. So our allocations in this adjustments budget, the positive allocations towards jobs amounts to 1.1 billion rand, to safety 80 million rand, to well-being 172 million rand, COVID-19 1.7 uh, billion rand, and then other adjustments that we are making outside of those of those four areas amounts to about 35 million rand. The reductions overall for this adjustments budget or the minuses that you will see in the votes, 1.8 million rand is for COE alone, 86 million rand um, that you see in reductions on conditional grants, that is the contribution to SA, the SAA bailout, and that's one of the reasons why our conditional grants was reduced by 86 million rand. Um, our reduction to our own revenue, as I indicated, because of the impact of COVID is 198 million rand, surrender to the provincial revenue fund of 532 million rand is the impact of COVID, but also preparing ourselves for constrained um, MTEF allocations going forward with reallocations to the next financial year. So the pluses amounts to 1.4 billion rand, and with all those negatives, gives us then that net amount that we are appropriating in this adjustments budget for 1.2 billion rand. The next slide then says in terms of what is the impact then that those allocations would then have on infrastructure per category. And you'll see then overall for our infrastructure budget that we are increasing that budget by a net 104 million rand. Most of the changes and where the impact is really in the adjustments, is on upgrading and additions. So you'll see that increases by about 295 million rand. And that's mainly in terms of education with the allocation that I mentioned on maintenance and our fencing program. In terms of our schools program towards the Western Cape Recovery Plan, 
And then also you see that there's a negative um, on refurbishing and rehabilitation to 196 million rand. And that is mainly within the Department of Transport and Public Works. It is about reducing when the motor vehicle license fees reduces in terms of revenue we find, then that impacts also our roads and our infrastructure budget because there's, there's, we have to then reduce our expenditure concomitantly. And that would then impact in terms of our, our, roads, our roads projects going forward, but also in terms of due to the slower response from our construction industry and where our construction industry finds itself, we've also had to uh, phase over a longer period the rollout of our current planned projects to next financial year, and that has a reduction impact in the current financial year, also of about 112 million rand um, on infrastructure in the current financial year. To take us forward to show you in terms of what is the impact on municipalities by these reductions in the adjustments budget is my colleague uh, Stephen Kenyon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Dick. Thank you very much, Annelies. I'll take it forward and uh, good, good morning again, uh, Chair and Honourable Members. Um, and thank you, Chair, for the warm words of welcome to the Western Cape. Um, it's, it's great to be here and I, I look forward to the challenges um, of being in the intergovernmental system in a different sphere for a change. Um, and this, this slide actually takes us, um, brings together two spheres in that intergovernmental system. So it, it shows you the 8.7 billion that um, Ms. Pick was talking to on the previous slide um, on provincial spending, um, as well as the 12.5 billion in adjusted municipal infrastructure spending within the province um, for the combined total of 21.2 billion invested planned investment in infrastructure by the two, sphere, two spheres within the province. Um, and you'll see there um, more than half of that municipal infrastructure investment is in trading services, mainly in water and wastewater, um, also in, in electricity and waste management. Um, and that six billion, six and a half billion in trading services investment by the municipalities complements um, the, the larger social infrastructure and economic infrastructure um, investments on the part of the provincial government. So that the combined total, you have just over six billion in combined economic infrastructure investment, um, just under seven billion in combined social infrastructure, and then six and a half in trading services. Then on the next slide, um, we're going to look a little bit deeper at the municipal infrastructure spending. Um, and key to note here is the large increase in planned expenditure relative to last year on the part of municipalities. So that 12.5 billion that they're planning to spend this year um, is quite a significant increase from the 8.7 billion that was achieved last year. But obviously, the preliminary audit outcomes for last year are reflecting somewhat lower achievement because of the, the impact of the lockdown, um, although there always is some discrepancy between planned spending um, and actual spending realized in municipalities. Um, and you'll also see that there has been in the municipal adjustments budgets, that the special adjustments budgets that have been passed so far, uh, a small reduction in um, planned projects uh, for this year, um, but it's a significant. It is still a significant increase relative to last year in municipal infrastructure investment, and also important to highlight here that it's less dependent on transfers than previously. So um, national transfers to municipalities for infrastructure have declined, but municipalities in the province have still increased their infrastructure budgets, um, which is quite impressive, um, and obviously depends on the diversification of own revenue streams in municipalities to be able to finance that. Okay, that concludes the infrastructure portion. Then the third and final section of the in-year adjustment to the budgets is the changes to provincial transfers to municipalities. There are a lot of small changes um, to allocations for individual projects in the transfers between the province and municipalities. Um, these are, include 
uh, the allocation of funds that were previously unallocated within grants. They include some additions to the grants and also some savings or some reductions in grants. The net impact of all of them is just under a hundred million rand increase in transfers from the province to municipalities. We've listed a few of the, the um, examples of the increases here, um, the largest of which is a 30 million rand uh, allocation to addition to support the George Integrated Public Transport Network. Um, I should highlight also that something like on the, on the bottom bullet there, there's a, a reduction of only 1.5 million a uh, saving on the Western Cape Financial Management Capacity Grant, but because it affects every municipality just about, um, it shows as a 100,000 rand reduction on uh, um, a lot of municipal budgets. So if we go to the next slide, um, it'll show you the breakdown of um, the impact per municipality. And there you can see for a lot of municipalities that that 100, 101,000 reduction is the only impact you see, but you look at a place like George, you see significant increases um, as well. So there's quite a, a dynamic picture here made up of a lot of small changes to municipal allocation. And then on the next slide, which is the last one of this section, we just show the impact of um, changes in national conditional grants. Um, and National Treasury would have taken you through these same numbers on Monday. Um, so in the first adjustments budget, there were really large changes um, to um, in conditional grant transfers to municipalities in the province. And in the second adjustments budget at national, there's then a follow through of a series of smaller reductions, mainly, um, as Annalise said, to finance the SAA bailout. And that concludes the adjustments budget portion. And I'm going to hand back to Dr. Haverman to take you through the, the medium term framework. Thank you, Mr. Kenyon. Thank you very much. Um, so that was a lot of information. Um, uh, this is basically tries to summarize um, the situation as it is at the moment. Uh, just to remind the committee what we've done essentially is we've taken you through, and that was what Ms. Pick did essentially, was the adjusted estimates. So that is the in-year changes to the budget. And uh, she showed you um, how we did that and what all the changes were there. So this is trying to summarize both that process, which is the adjusted budgets and the adjusted estimates for this financial year. So that's on the left-hand side of that line. And then also our, our medium-term estimates um, for the fiscal framework over the next three years. So that's also one of the things we started. If we could just pause and, and just bring together everything as far as possible here um, and that gives you an outline of where we go ahead i think we have spoken at the beginning about these numbers particularly the equitable share forecast um, the conditional grants forecast um, we've spoken a little bit about the own receipts what's mainly there is the gambling taxes but also own receipts and uh, own income that each of the the departments earn and that they use to um, support their operations for example, motor vehicle license fees and so forth. The asset financing reserve um, refers to money that we have uh, on reserve for financing of large infrastructure projects. Uh, then the minister spoke about um, the financing in addition to that of how we've, we've looked at uh, drawing down reserves and then uh, the provincial revenue fund uh, tax receipts. So that gives you a total um, of 71, 72, and 73 over the MTF, with a total amount of spending of 216 billion or so. Uh, and then below that, we give the uh, percentages uh, uh, set out there. So this just tries to bring it all together in one slide, Chair, and, and show exactly how it all fits together. If we go to the next slide, um, What we do there, I'm not sure if it's, oh, there we go. What we do there is we try and show you how it has changed um, relative to the um, previous budget. Um, essentially, as we discussed before, uh, the 25.2 billion reduction over the MTF. 
and that's made up of reductions in each fiscal year over the MTF. Uh, I think we've explained it before. As we put out there below, the conditional grants don't change. Um, asset financing reserve, uh, there are some changes there, which we've indicated. Uh, PRF, there are changes there too. Uh, provincial Revenue Fund uh, tax receipts, also some changes. And then the provincial own receipts, uh, also some minor downward revisions. Uh, I think it's very, yeah, yes, very much. And, and I think really what we're trying to show you is that there is enormous pressure on the system um, and there are enormous pressures on the votes. Uh, you will remember that there was also a slide showing, uh, I think Ms. Frick presented it, showing it that we're expecting quite a lot of uh, downward pressure on particularly the large votes. And so what I'm going to do is ask the HOD just to finally take you through to the end and explain what our thinking is around how we're going to support um, service delivery to make sure that these significant reductions in spending don't have long-term implications on service delivery. Um, so I'll hand over now to the HOD. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Chair. Yes, the, I think Dr. Haverman has ended off on the point of noting the, the enormous pressures uh, that are now being brought to bear on the fiscal framework and by association, of course, the, uh, the votes uh, and the departments of the provincial government and, um, and the implications that that could have for, seri for service delivery particularly if we're not actively managing the downside risks here. The, it is, uh, I'm sure uh, that members have noted, a very complex and dynamic situation that's filled with a number of large uncertainties uh, as, to, uh, as to what the final outturns uh, will be. In fact, it's probably the only certainty that we do have on the table here is that change is no longer optional. Uh, we do need to take measures decisively to, un to implement change processes in how we conceive of and deliver services uh, in, in, the, in the province. So as the provincial uh, treasury, from a technical perspective, we uh, looked at the risk of an across-the-board deflation in expenditures and the likelihood that that translates into negative effects on service delivery and realized that there were additional measures that were required to support a more um, uh, um, service delivery focused transition. Um, and we looked at a lot of the global evidence in this in this respect of what uh, what is, what are drivers of successful change processes and where do they get blocked and one gets um, low level uh, uh, lower level outcomes um, and the critical issue that uh, that has been faced globally and we believe that we're facing in in the Western Cape as well is that there are often upfront costs of implementing, designing and implementing changes to service delivery modalities, even though they will induce longer term sustained savings. And it's these upfront costs that actually prevent, uh, prevent departments uh, from executing and implementing these, uh, these changes. And so in this context, we've designed a fiscal transition support facility, it's by no means all of the work that's required for these transitions, but it is, it is a set of fiscal measures that is required to support departments in undertaking trans, uh, these, these service delivery um, uh, transitions uh, to, to accommodate some of the upfront costs while reaping those uh, longer term savings. We have set aside, as Minister Mania has, had mentioned in his speech, 20% uh, of our reserves in each year, which adds up to a fairly significant amount of money that can support the redesign uh, and, and transition to new service delivery uh, modalities. And we think that this is a significant opportunity and incentive for um, for provincial government departments and public entities to look at new ways of uh, undertaking their their business, uh, and as as Minister Mania had uh, had indicated, exploring partnerships with uh, with the private sector, with non governmental service delivery entities, and so forth. We the in terms of the broad uh, approach to the facility, 
uh, we are focusing really on those uh, um, those departments that and services that are facing often immutable spending pressures that they're unable to accommodate uh, reductions, but can see a pathway towards transition to to a low, lower cost models. Um, but we are asking them to show us what that transition would look like. Uh, what are the development outcomes and the fiscal impacts that may come, the positive development outcomes and positive fiscal impacts that may come from this uh, um, uh, uh, a revision to these service delivery arrangements. In our first round of engagements with departments, we got some very exciting and potentially significant uh, proposals. Uh, they ranged from very frontline um, uh, services uh, for example, medicines delivery, um, um, uh, a complete uh, a revision of the system there, to very exciting uh, areas around citizen-focused um, digitization of services, to uh, improvements in surveillance technology uh, and finding efficiencies uh, across uh, through commodity-based sourcing strategies um, and, and the like. So there are a number of interesting proposals that are on the table, but I think members must realize that, that uh, you know, departments have as yet had a very limited time to respond to the severity of these shifts. Uh, and this is the medium term budget uh, policy framework. The intention is that as we go towards the final medium term expenditure framework to be tabled in March, they would have further opportunity to develop the proposals and subject them to uh, uh, and subject them to both peer review and technical appraisal um, by by the Treasury. There are, of course, not just uh, measures that are required on the fiscal side and so we uh, to support a transition we are working very closely as the provincial treasury with the department of the premier in particular in looking at toolkits for example to manage uh, to, to enable accounting officers to manage the compensation reductions uh, effectively um, and so forth we are therefore um, I think trying to uh, put out a series of measures uh, an integrated series of measures um, and uh, that would support a service delivery transition and therefore the fiscal transition facility is really um, it, it, it is a is a key element of that um, and to make sure that we're managing this uh, we, we, we're managing this uncertainty in a constructive um, way with uh, with departments uh, if we go to the final slide just to conclude um, we've, I think, highlighted uh, a number of critical risks going forward, particularly around the outcome of the wage agreement uh, and both from 2019 onwards and in the current year and how that could affect this fiscal framework, um, as well as uh, our ongoing technical engagements on the compensation approach with the, with the National Treasury and, of course, uh, Minister Mania's um, uh, conversation with Minister Mbaweni uh, on, these, uh, on these issues there. These are hard discussions, uh, but the, the discussions with national are, of course, not the only thing we need to do. There are hard discussions required uh, with accounting officers uh, in the provincial government on compensation, on new ways of work, and on service delivery models. And uh, it may sound uh, redundant to say it, but clearly one needs to make sure that even our policy priorities as a province are themselves prioritized to maximize, um, to ma to maximize the impact of the spending of our re resources. We are taking a number of other measures in the course of this year and over the medium term to support uh, to support uh, our votes in repositioning themselves for this new environment. Uh, one of those is uh, uh, our own Western Cape uh, emphasis on what Minister Mboweni has called uh, zero-based budgeting, which is re-looking at program or sub-program rationales. We are focusing in on our compensation spending at the moment uh, and have been actively working on, on that, uh, but we are planning to undertake reviews, uh, uh, additional reviews at a, a cluster classification vote program and sub-program level. Uh, in association with our departments and also a review of our current contractual commitments and the risks engendered by them. So this is 
to conclude a while we're tabling the second uh, adjustments uh, budget for the current financial year today we've laid out a framework within which the remainder of prep of of our efforts for preparation for the 2021 medium term extent expenditure framework will continue uh, the formal steps in that in that regard will be medium term expenditure committee meetings in late uh, late January uh, and culminating in the tabling of that framework um, and the uh, 2021 appropriations uh, in in the House on the 4th of March next year. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you so That's much. OK, as you can see there, I saw two hands on leading days. But I'm just going to ask that um, the mics in the chamber be switched off just so that we don't have an echo. Honorable McKenzie, Honorable Bosman, I see your hands. Anyone else for the first round? And then we'll take Honorable Marie after Honorable Bosman. Okay, we'll take those three hands and then Honorable Mvimbi after Honorable Marie. Perfect. Um, I'll take those four hands first. Uh, Minister and HOD, you can um, obviously answer the questions and allocate it to persons as they come. But uh, Mackenzie, Vosman, Marem, Vimbi, and then I'll keep Honorable Dagmar for the next round because I've already indicated I'll take the first four hands. Thank you, Chairperson. In, in that order. And uh, thank you, Panda, for the presentation. And to our colleagues from National Treasury, uh, I just want to say who's now Provincial Treasury is Leka Nikau. So welcome to Cape Town, as they say. Mm -hmm. And thank you for the presentation and, and obviously for the Minister's budget speech, indeed the budget to bounce back. You know, every time I see the 86 million reduction figures, I get butterflies in my stomach because I know where the money's going to. It's going to SAA, which is not going to give us any return on investment. Uh, but uh, let that be, we are there and we have to deal with the cars that we've been given. Two things, just one and a, an observation. The, the reserves and on one of the slides, we have sufficient reserves, reserves available. And then on slide number 11, 864 million. And um, slide number, page number 10, I think, 860 significant provincial reserves. I just want us to be mindful about how we use that because I don't want us to walk away with the impression that we've got um, hundreds of millions of rands we can just tap into whenever a national government makes a mistake. Uh, uh, so that's just my observation on that. It seems to be got to enough money laying around, which I know is not true. It's a reserve for emergencies. On the slide, page number nine, um, in exploring new ways of financing to prepare, where and how are we with this process and going forward, uh, what are we going to do uh, um, to ensure that does takes place within the, uh, uh, the required framework? Obviously, this is the first that this is done, I think, since 1996. I just wanted to get an idea where that is. Mm -hmm. And then with the second wave coming, is our reserves going to be sufficient given where we are uh, on the current uh, 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 lockdown, uh, uh, not the current lockdown, where we are in terms of the disaster management and going forward over the next six months, if we need to go uh, another provision for food, for example, in Feb, March next year, and possibly extended by another six or eight weeks, uh, uh, because we are drawing down, we're drawing down, but at which point are we going to say, hey, guys, let's stop drawing down, otherwise the kit is going to be empty. I just want to get that sense. I think, Chairperson, the rest we'll take to the committees. I'll leave that as that for now. Thank you. Thank you, Member uh, McKenzie. Member Bosman. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, Chair, I just have a question uh, based on what Mr. Kenyon was um presenting to us, I think it was on page uh, 39. I just wanted to find out, Chairperson, the uh, money allocated to the Kanalant municipality, um, which I think it's 3.6 million. Um, if Mr. Kenyon can perhaps tell us what that is for. Um, it just says it's under Western Cape Municipal Interventions Grant. So if you could perhaps maybe just expand on what that is for. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Member Marie. Thank you, Chair. I'm concerned about our revenue um, uh, uh, reserves that's being utilised to sort of make up for the reduction in your budget. So, uh, over the medium term, uh, do you think this is going to be a regular situation? Uh, we don't know whether there's going to be another lockdown. Uh, that will be disastrous, as, as I heard. Uh, 
some of the presenters have said this will be a complete shock if there must be another lockdown. Now, in your preparations for the possibility of such a lockdown, do you feel you're going to eat some more into our reserves? The municipalities is going to be in big trouble because the Western Cape only got 6% of the allocation to municipalities in the country. Western Cape received only 6%. So the demand is not only going to come from our own budget, but also from municipalities. And uh, uh, what would be our next move? Should there be a further lockdown? Is there any um, um, a sort of overall plan uh, in the event of that happening? Thank you. Thank you, Member Mvimbi. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, I think, I'm, I think I've got uh, one or two questions, really. But in, generally, Chairperson, as you, if you can recall, when we started looking at the adjustment of the budget uh, because of the reality of the COVID-19, it was indicated, I think it was sometime in July, if I'm not mistaken, on the 23rd of July, when we had a similar meeting like this uh, of the budget committee, that uh, having been confronted by COVID-19, I think the, the Treasury has adopted a three-pronged approach of, uh, of the short term and the immediate, as well as the, the medium. And then because when we ask question then we, uh, as to whether, because if you look at the, the economic recovery plan, it must not only just be the economic recovery plan, it must also be the restructuring of the economy because COVID-19 has actually exposed the desperate inequalities. So you need to also begin to bring in new players into the economy as well. And then it was indicated that some of those you won't be able to see that in the in the short term. Then you probably see it in the immediate, which is run about this this time. I just want to check whether has is that being addressed in this uh, uh, budget um, adjustment? Because I seem to be. I know this is a general question, but I would like to get a reaction as to whether are we really with this readjustment now addressing the restructuring of the economy so that we can also allow new players into the economy as well, especially those that we actually systematically excluded into the mainstream of the economy. Uh, now, also, the other three areas of focus uh, that has been mentioned is the issue of, as I think also alluded by the uh, provincial minister in his, in, in his speech that it will be safety, jobs, and well-being. Obviously, most of the money goes to job, which I suppose is also about uh, trying to address the economic challenges that we are having. But there's just one particular issue I wanted to just focus on, because I think the minister also maybe he, he might want to respond on this. I think he mentioned a number of small, a certain number of small businesses that will be assisted in the process. I think it was 130, if I'm not mistaken, or, or something like that. Now, during the first round of the adjustment of the budget, there was about uh, 14 million that was put aside for small businesses, which I think personally it's very small amount of, if you look at the challenges that uh, that we are faced with and the exposure that was done by COVID-19 around the economic challenges. But now if I look here, yeah, I think based on the presentation that was done, there's an amount of 12 million, which is, uh, I think is for small businesses. Has that amount now been reduced from 14 million to, to 12 million? I just wanted to, I think those are, will be my question, Chairperson. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, uh, Minister and HOD. I will leave to you for answering, and then I will take a second round. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. I'm going to uh, respond in general to some of the questions and specifically uh, to others. I think there's been a, a general question about uh, uh, reserves. And I think the, the point that we have to make in, in the first instance uh, is that uh, all credit to my predecessors and indeed to the provincial treasury, it's only because uh, the province was prudent in the past that we've been able uh, to lean in uh, and uh, in the first instance, uh, support frontline departments uh, on the, uh, in the fight against the pandemic, uh, significantly protect particularly education and health from uh, 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 immutable spending pressures, and of course now to lean in over the medium term and support departments uh, with the difficult, uh, difficult transition uh, through the fiscal transition support uh, facility. Uh, to the extent uh, that the provincial government needs to respond, of course, to the resurgence of COVID-19, I think it's important for members of the committee to bear in mind that our first response uh, will draw on existing resources uh, which are ring-fenced on the budgets uh, of uh, frontline departments, uh, including health, where 227 million rand is uh, ring-fenced uh, as a first response, and 200 million rand uh, is ring-fenced on the uh, Department of Transport and Public Works' uh, budget. It is only uh, uh, if we exhausted those resources that we would have to consider um, dipping into our uh, provincial uh, reserves. So I wish to make that point uh, to, to start. Uh, there was also a question about well, what will provincial government's uh, response be in the event uh, of a, a significant uh, resurgence of uh, COVID-19? And uh, honourable members would be aware that the, uh, that the Premier Alan Wundi uh, briefed uh, the media uh, yesterday in some detail uh, about the resurgence and also said that he will be convening uh, a meeting on Friday uh, to uh, design the provincial response. And I uh, am sure that there will be uh, further announcements in the weeks and weeks and weeks uh, in due course. Minister, apologies for interrupting. Minister Mania, it just seems that the sound from the chamber has just dipped quite low. Perhaps there's two mics on in the chamber, perhaps. Uh, Chair, can I, uh, is this a little bit better? It is better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Chair, I was saying that I, I think that uh, honourable members can expect uh, Premier Alan Wendy uh, to make uh, a further announcement after the meeting on Friday about what measures will be put in place uh, to deal with the uh, resurgence of COVID-19 uh, in the Western Cape. There was then a uh, further question uh, about uh, support to small small business, and I just think uh, I, it's fair to to clarify. And I think this question was put by the Honourable Mvumbi, uh, whether the 12 million rand actually amounted to a reduction in the support for small business. Uh, the answer to that question is no. In fact, the contrary is true. In our uh, first adjustments budget, uh, we mobilized 27 million rand combined to support small, uh, small businesses, uh, and we hope to support about 230 small businesses. The 12 million rand, which was mentioned in the second adjustment budget, is in fact an additional 12 million rand, which we are making available to support small business, which means that in this financial year, uh, we will have mobilized 39 million rand uh, to support uh, small businesses. Uh, I couldn't agree with uh, the Honourable uh, Member more. We would have liked uh, to have been able to mobilise additional funding, uh, but I hope the Honourable Member uh, appreciates that uh, there, we are in an environment where there are significant uh, fiscal uh, constraints. Thank you. If I could then hand over to the um, uh, to David Savage and Team Finance. 
Thank you. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, Honourable Members, for the for the questions. I think the Minister has very adequately addressed uh, some. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Haverman to specifically talk on the infrastructure finance issues and Mr. Kenyon to specifically address the, the, the Cunnelant, um issues. On the question of reserves, you know, as, as the Minister said, we, we built up as this province a rainy day fund. And it's not raining, but it's pouring. So that would have been in vain, effectively, if we were to fail to deploy it where it's most urgently needed at uh, at this at this point. That is the that is the purpose of of effectively sterilising money in in a reserve because of these uh, unanticipated significant events. Um, the but as as much as we draw from the reserves, we keenly aware that part of our um, a part of the recovery is the need to rebuild these reserves. Um, that is going to need to be something that we focus on collectively as a provincial government, because as we've learned now, the world is uh, full of unanticipated uh, occurrences, and some of them are very, uh, very dramatic. Um, the uh, just to to say um, one other thing in terms of the, the the positioning that we have in place already for a potential resurgence of the of uh, of COVID uh, in this financial year. Minister Mania had said, and I think Annalise uh, Pick had repeated it, is that there's already 427 million rand in position and available uh, on the votes of departments. Um, the, we have facilities like Brackengate, the field hospital of hope, that is, that is operational at this point, and we have the resources to keep it operational. We already, and what's not in these figures, is our inventory around things like PPE. So we do have, we have built up aggressively inventory, and members who've been reading our public disclosure reports on COVID-related uh, procurements will have seen that in the health department, we have built up and we maintain a significant inventory. That's things like gloves, masks, uh, um, and so forth that are required for our frontline personnel that we already have in our stores. The, uh, we have then beyond that, as we've mentioned, an additional 867 million of reserves that we had for this year that we can still deploy in this year. So I think uh, Minister Maria, uh, Member Maria had, uh, had asked the question, is it sufficient for the second wave? In our discussions with the Department of Health, we asked exactly that question on more than one occasion, and the answer was that is sufficient for our projections. We, of course, then asked the question, well, how confident are you in your projections? And we are all in relatively uncharted territory here. The one thing that we have agreed on is that we should be adopting a strongly evidence-led, uh, uh, data-rich approach to how we manage the, 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 the pandemic in the province. And at the center, the brain's trust of this has been the Provincial Health Data Center. And that is why there's an additional funding in this year that is provided for the Provincial Health Data Center um, and the, the very highly capable um, um, uh, medical personnel we have operating uh, that that center, and they're critical to to the design of, of of the response. So, you know, we can't we we feel confident that the resources are in place, ready to be deployed. We can continue to rapidly draw on the reserves if we need to do so. What we don't draw on, uh, we will carry through as part of our available response in the next financial year. Um, with uh, with re um, regard to um, uh, Honourable Mvimbi's questions on the restructuring and bringing in new players in the in the economy, a lot of the, the challenge that we face as a province is that a lot of the economic policy levers, the policy competence in terms of legal authority, lies with national government uh, on on these matters. We focus therefore very much on the things that we can do. One of the things I'm very passionate about, uh, and we all are in the provincial treasury, is around building uh, easy to, to operate supply chain management systems that allow, allow small businesses to become suppliers to the provincial government seamlessly. Um, we have invested in that over time. One of the very interesting effects 
of the uh, procurement disclosure reports is that a lot of small businesses are looking at the prices obtained through our procurements and it is increasing the level of com uh, competition and participation and that we think is a very big opportunity for small business uh, in the province. I'd also draw um, uh, members' at uh, attention to, uh, to page 337 through uh, 345 of the, um, the uh, second adjusted estimates of provincial revenue and expenditure. Um, which gives a statement in terms of the funding that has been made available to small businesses to date in the province um, very successfully. The benefit of a small business targeted approach, as our colleagues from, uh, from the Department of Economic Development and Tourism will tell you, is that they tend to be significantly more job rich. These businesses, they employ lots of peop people. Uh, in, uh, as a collective, uh, and they have a relatively small financing requirement to stay uh, afloat and in business. And so we're able to support a relatively large number, as you will see from the list that is um, that is provided there. Um, let me ask uh, Dr. Haverman to come in and then Mr. Kenyon on the two remaining questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Savage, and thank you, Chair, and thank you also to uh, Honourable McKenzie for the very warm welcome. I, I certainly am enjoying it so far. Um, on infrastructure finance, I think certainly the big concern, obviously, is that with large-scale reductions in spending, uh, that the infrastructure plans are delayed or um, are even set aside, and I think that may be fatal to the long-run um, growth prospects of the province. And so, as the minister said in his speech, we are thinking uh, all the time about new ways of financing infrastructure, revitalizing public-private partnerships, and um, finding new ways um, to crowd in private sector investment uh, into infrastructure. Uh, the province certainly has got a long history of um, some successful projects, um, and so uh, we are looking together with our colleagues uh, in transport and public works um, and uh, in the other departments um, on how we can bring about uh, 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 ways of financing infrastructure. That means we will no longer need to rely on a provincial equitable share. If you think about it, um, if you buy a house, and uh, you just use your, your, the annual income that you use um, to pay the house cash uh, compared to finding a way of obviously um, borrowing that money and, and borrowing it specifically for infrastructure, borrowing it specifically for investment. Um, it's quite easy to see that you can get a lot more for your money if you think very carefully about borrowing in a, in a very prudent and careful way. Um, and so that's what we're looking at, at doing. Um, I'll hand over now to Mr. Kenyon for the uh, question, for those questions. Chair, if I may, just before Mr. Kenyon comes in, um, and perhaps as a marketing ploy, because the team did work very hard on the documentation that's been made available. There is a further, more detailed discussion on the infrastructure questions uh, in the medium uh, term budget policy statement document on pages 39 to 43, um, so with which I think uh, fills out uh, some of the detail in that respect. Thank you, Mr. Savage. Mr. Kenyon. Thank you, Chair. Um, and if I can uh, follow my head of department's lead um, also on, on questions on the changes to municipal allocations, there is a lot of detail provided in the Gazette that has also been published today. Um, on the specific question from Honorable um, Bossman on the um, allocations to Canaland, those are allocations from a grant administered by the Department of Local Government. So it's for a series of projects that they have agreed with the municipality. Um, I can just give you the highlights of, of what those projects are, the, the specific details of how much exactly is for each project um, the, the department would, you know, is, is, is negotiating with the municipality, so you'd, we'd have to ask them for the detail. But the largest project is on property valuation, on the property valuation role. Um, so all of the projects, I should say, broadly support the financial recovery plan 
of the municipality. So the property valuation role in that municipality has not been updated since 2013, the general valuation role. Um, as members might be aware, in terms of the Property Rates Act, that role is meant to be updated every four years. So it's long overdue for an update, um, and it's a significant constraint to the municipality's ability to generate its own revenue. Um, it is also quite an expensive process. So the department is, is, pro is providing funding to ensure that the municipality can complete that project, um, which should have significant um, revenue benefits in, in future. So that's the largest of the projects. Um, other projects include um, installing a backup server. So the municipality has a computer server, but they have no backup at the moment, which is a huge risk um, to data integrity there. If anything was to happen to that server, um, they, they would be in serious trouble. Um, there is also a small water conservation project um, around leaks. This is obviously a, a drought vulnerable area as well as the revenue implications of um, water demand management. So that's a kind of a two for one benefit there. And then there are also some um, vehicle purchases, small vehicle purchases um, in, uh, included in the project. Um, and these, these, I think the department, if I'm not mistaken, the department is trying to purchase um, secondhand vehicles from other municipalities in the province. Um, so they're sort of facilitating that um, with other municipalities to, to further reduce the cost for the municipality. But obviously, the municipalities need vehicles um, to be able to operate. So it's a series of those projects. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. I just want to check whether all the first round questions have been dealt with. If there's anyone else to answer still? If none, then that's no problem. If none, the hands that I see in the order is Honourable Dugmore from previously, and uh, Honourable Heron and Honourable Murray. Um, if no other hands, then I will throw my questions in after um, Honourable Murray. In that order, Member Dugmore. Member Dugmore, are you with us still? Member Heron, can you continue so long, please? Thanks, Chairperson. Yes, um, I have. Uh, my first two questions are just to get some clarity on um, some terms that I don't really understand or know um, in the in the presentation. On slide 27, we introduced something called policy-based funding facility. So I wonder if we, I can get an explanation as to what that is and what the source of funding is. And on uh, slide 42, there's a PRF financing. I have a similar question. What is a PRF financing? Um, on slide 36, there was um, a, a note that said something like decrease in provincial grant grants and transfers reflect Western Cape government's policy positions and three-phase budgeting approach. Um, if I can get an explanation as to what that means, what are the policy priorities that led to a reduction in provincial grants and transfers. And then my final question on slide 32, where there's a breakdown of how funding is allocated according to the priorities, jobs, safety, and well-being. Um, there's an indication of the jobs um, allocation comprising of 875 million rand, it says national, I assume it means national uh, funding, and 276 million for, uh, it says provincial funding. But the information is that the, um, the national funding that was allocated to the province was 814 million. So if I can just get an explanation of that 875 million versus the 814 million that is reflected in the earlier part of the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Member Dugmore, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, you know, um, what I would like to ask, I mean, in, if we could just put up that slide, which basically shows a summary um, of the um, allocations, both equitable share and conditional grants, um, right through until 23-24. I mean, in the figures that the MEC gave us, um, he mentioned uh, 71 for 2021, 72 for 2022, and 73. But obviously that includes the 
you know, um, that includes the amounts um, from our own receipts and our own revenue. Um, I think yeah, there was another, I think one of the other tre treasury official um, gave, gave, it was like even a sort of a more concise summary of exactly what it all looks like, um, which included, uh, yeah, I, I think that's it. Yeah, that, just go back. Thank you. I think it was the one, the previous one. Um, but what I'm, yeah, this one. So if you see the, the transfers from national um, include obviously the equitable share and the conditional grants. Now, we, those transfers were in this current year, 66, and then 21, 22, they go up to 67, and then 22, 23, they go up to 68, and then they go up to 69. And obviously with the own receipts and asset financing, et cetera, those figures increase slightly. Now, when the Premier addressed the House after the President, he made the statement that there will be a reduction of 10 billion rand, um, you know, over the MTF. Whereas if you actually look at those transfers from national, I see 66, then I see 67, then I see 68, then I see 69. Now, obviously, the cost um, compensation of employees is, is a matter that has be been explained to us. So I would just like to ask the MEC that in, in was was the Premier, did the Premier make a mistake when he indicated that there would be um, re reductions of, of 10 billion um, over the MTF um, when you look at those figures? Because in, in real terms, you know, you see the 66 going up to 67, 68, and then 69. That's the one thing. And then um, I would just like to ask, there's a, re there's a reference there that 20% of the Western Cape Provincial Government Reserves will go towards the fiscal transition support facility. Um, so if we could just get um, from the MEC or the HOD um, exactly um, what is the, um, the extent of the reserves that currently exist um, in the Western Cape uh, Provincial Government. Um, because I presume that um, the MEC, when he mentioned that 1.7 billion um, if 1.7 billion is 20%, um, do we essentially have about 8 or 10 billion left in the uh, provincial reserves? And then my last question just goes to the um, recovery plan. Um, and I think our concern is that in the presentation we had, um, you know, we were informed that, in fact, the provincial recovery plan will only be finalized by February next year. And we asked in the committee whether we could actually have a copy of the implementation plan. Because if you look at the National South African Economic Restructuring and Recovery Plan, the implementation plan, you actually have um, a list of all of the interventions, where the funding is coming from or whether there is no funding, what is the impact, um, who's the lead, and what is the time frame. So you actually have a detailed implementation plan um, from national government in regard to the the South African Economic Restructuring and Recovery Plan. So I just want to ask, is it correct that at this point in time, the province does not have an implementation plan for its provincial um, recovery plan and that that would only be ready by February next year? I just want to ask if I'm understanding the process correctly as it's being followed in the province at the moment. Thanks. Thank you, Member Dugmore. Member Mare. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I think that I would rather spin uh, the question posed by my colleague uh, Cameron Dougal and say, does the national government have any plan how they're going to get out of their debt crisis, which is looming? Because I'm very concerned that, that if we say that the, the, the our debt is going to rise 82% of our GDP, now that brings me to my question. We have a situation where there is great uncertainty. Uh, uh, there's a, a volatile climate created by this downgrading by Moody's and other other agencies internationally. Now, South Africa, of course, is going to pay much, much more uh, just to service our debts, as we heard. And yet we've drawn up these uh, budget and projections 
I would like to know, was it before we became aware that um, we we're going to get uh, another two points uh, negative uh, downgrading into junk status? Was this budget uh, drawn up taking into account that fact or not? Uh, especially because while the government is in that big uh, crisis, they are negotiating uh, wage bills. And uh, I don't know what it, the outcome will be of the court uh, uh, case that's looming. And uh, as we heard now in the presentation, that uh, it could add up to 500 million to our own cost. If the wage freeze uh, doesn't come about, and if, if, if something happens in that regard that put a bigger uh, crisis in, uh, in provincial budgets. So I want to know, has this uh, budget been drawn up and projected, uh, knowing about the downgrade, taking it into account, and uh, in spite of the fact that there's uncertainty about the wage outcome of the wage agreement, and also the COVID-19, uh, I would like to know, maybe you can tell me, maybe you can't, and I will just put a question to uh, the next session. Um, what have we learned from this COVID crisis? We're sitting at home now. You must be saving quite a penny on, on, on parliamentary meals and tea and coffee and food and telephone calls and transport. Uh, was that a good thing or a bad thing, Minister Mania? Uh, is that uh, significant enough to say we should have less settings and do it virtually? Or do you say, no, we must go back to our old ways, uh, even though it's more costly? Thank you. Thank you, Member Maria. And with that, I will just throw my questions in now as well. Um, <clears throat> Minister, in the budget cuts of the conditional grants, we are seeing that we're going to have direct cuts that are going to have to be used to go to SAA. An example is the fact that just over 23 million rand is going to be cut from the title deeds grant. Another example is that a million rand is going to be cut from the cost grant from agriculture, which essentially assists with smallholder and black commercial farmers for the promotion and the facilitation of agriculture development. And that program targets beneficiaries of land reform, restitution and redistribution. And with all of these particular conditional grant cuts, what I wanted to find out was, is it possible to spend the money and then send the invoice to national government? Is that possible? Because a total of 86.6 million rand cut from conditional grants is essentially going to SAA. And can we ask SAA and the Minister for Public Enterprises, Minister Gordon, who is essentially the political head for that, for, for that enterprise, for public enterprises, to come and explain how the Western Cape's 86.6 million that's being cut from conditional grants is going to be used in order to keep an airline open that we don't need. The second question I have is, previously the Premier indicated that the Western Cape wants a seat at the labor negotiation table. Do we have that seat at the labor negotiation table yet? Or perhaps do we need to start our own discussion with labor with the Western Cape? There's a saying, and if I have the saying correct, it says something like, you know, if Muhammad cannot go to the mountain, perhaps we must bring the mountain to Muhammad. So is there a possibility for us to then bring the mountain to us? And then finally, before COVID in the Standing Committee of Finance, we actually had a briefing on data and how data and systems are assisting the Western Cape in terms of procurement. And in your, in your speech, you indicated that you're going to be increasing using data for procurement, as well as artificial intelligence. And I just would like to understand what is the difference now compared to the system previously that um, has been part of the provincial treasury department. Um, thank you so much. You can allocate the questions accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will uh, take a stab at some of the questions and again uh, leave uh, the balance to 
uh, team uh, finance to either supplement my replies or uh, reply where uh, I have uh, not replied. Uh, I think uh, the first point is uh, to the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I'm not sure what statement he is referring to, but I would think uh, that he uh, may be misrepresenting or misunderstanding what the uh, Premier may have said or may have implied. But at the end of the day, uh, there uh, are about 25.2 billion rands worth of, of budget cuts over the medium term penciled in for the Western Cape. On the whole question of the recovery plan, I think the difference between national government and the provincial government is that we are already implementing uh, the recovery plan. The plan is not the, the project. What we are already doing uh, is implementing the recovery plan with our uh, immediate response. And a good example of that would be uh, the subject which we uh, traversed earlier, our support to small business. Uh, we have already allocated uh, 27 uh, million rand to support small businesses uh, in our province. And uh, that money has already been uh, allocated to uh, support small business and save jobs in uh, the Western Cape. Uh, on the question of all the uncertainties, uh, which the Honorable uh, uh, Nerea refers to, uh, uncertainties about the wage agreements, the reaction of uh, the rating agencies to uh, the uh, uh, fiscal framework and to the medium-term budget policy statement, uh, I think just speaks to uh, the point that the HOD made in his introduction, that we are working in an environment of extreme and significant uh, un uncertainty. And because of the fact that uh, there is uncertainty, uh, particularly about the wage agreement, there is a big question about the credibility of the fiscal framework itself. And I think that goes a long way to explaining uh, why the rating agencies uh, switched uh, to, to rapid fire, I think last Friday, and uh, downgraded uh, our sovereign credit rating into sort of deep junk. On the whole question of uh, SAA, uh, we uh, as a, a provincial government uh, and indeed members of this committee, I think, uh, have a, an obligation, given the kinds of trade-offs, the choice between allocating uh, scarce resources to bail out uh, an airline compared to, for example, uh, the supporting uh, title deeds restoration, community health workers, uh, the land care grant. Given those kinds of trade-offs, which I, uh, I certainly and the provincial government certainly disagree, I think we do have to take it up uh, robustly. And I think, uh, Chair, uh, it would be a very good idea uh, if this committee or indeed another committee uh, called uh, the National Minister, Provincial Rock, the Minister of Public Enterprises, to explain uh, and to defend uh, these uh, trade-offs. And I think uh, what is most distressing about the situation is that, uh, and a point that I made in my speech, nobody believes, or almost nobody believes, that the 10.5 billion bailout which has been allocated to to to, uh, to Department of Ab uh, Public Enterprise to, to bail out South African Airways will be uh, the last uh, bailout. Uh, on the whole question of the, the wage agreement, I do know that the Premier uh, has uh, written to, to the President uh, about, uh, if you like, a seat at the table when it comes to, to bargaining on the Public Service Wage Bill. Uh, I am not uh, certain whether he's got a reply or what progress there's been, and I'd encourage the, the member to, to put a, uh, a question to uh, Premier Alan Windy on uh, that subject. Thank you. If I could hand over to the HOD and Team Finance. Thank you, Minister, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, members, for the questions. I will ask my colleagues to um, uh, to contribute as well. Uh, to Honourable Heron, uh, apologies for the descent into acronyms. 
um, we will try and clar clarify those uh, for you. It's a sort of shorthand that I think sneaks into the presentations. Uh, by policy-based funding, what we're really referring to is the critical priorities of jobs, um, safety, and well-being in the province. And we, uh, in, in this environment, had to had to search uh, um, in quite some detail to make sure that we had resources available to support the initial phase of uh, pursuing those priorities in this financial year. And so we took a fund-based approach um, rather than to allow departments to simply reprioritize within their votes. We said uh, you, one needed to consolidate the, this funding in a virtual fund, which we called a policy-based funding facility, and then distribute it um, uh, and distribute it again. Um, so uh, that was that. That was the sort of uh, history of the term, um, which I accept can be a, a little bit uh, of a shorthand here. The PRF pr refers to the provincial um, revenue fund, um, and uh, let me. Uh, I'll, I'll ask my colleagues to address some of your other questions. Uh, Stephen Kenyon on the on the question on slide 36, uh, and Annalise Pick uh, the question on slide. 32. Um, Honorable Dagmore, with res respect to the funding of the fiscal transition support facility, uh, there were kind of two interlinked questions that you asked there. Uh, the 20% of the provincial re uh, reserves. Well, the first, the first part of that, of course, is that the 20% is a target figure. It's not the actual allocations. That will be determined by the time by March, uh, when the application, when specific applications for funding would have been um, uh, submitted, appraised, uh, and and uh, and in the process of authorization. Um, the uh, the second part of that is that in each year, uh, and you'll know this from past budgets, of the resources that are available to the province, we. Do we we um, do not fully allocate all of those resources in every year, and that amount grows slightly over the medium term because of uncertainties associated with time. You know, it's something that we, we're less certain about what will happen in year three than we are about what will happen in year one. So we leave aside resources uh, in the in the annual envelope. Uh, for each year that we do not appropriate in the bill. Those resources remain, therefore, in the revenue fund. That's the reserve. Um, the, pro the, the only other re reserves that the, the, the province has is from one-off one revenue re receipts uh, that we direct towards um, uh, asset, uh, asset financing because they're one-off in nature. We would prefer to convert that into an asset that is a lasting benefit to the to the to the um, residents of the western the western Cape and this and the other the other reserve that we have uh, aside is money that is just a liquidity buffer for India variations between receipts and expenditures that we have to dip into. But my colleague, um, I, I think Annalise can also talk to that in um, in slightly more detail. The so um, I, I wouldn't say that the the one one this is a small part of the overall financing available in each year for uh, unforeseen and unavoidable um, expenses, and so we are uh, we are um, leveraging that for for fiscal transition, and the actual allocation will be obviously be a function of what is what successfully navigates the appraisal um, the appraisal process. Um, Chairperson, in respect to your questions. Um, I think uh, uh, your your suggestion. I understand the motivation for the suggestion, but I would caution that that would result in unauthorized expenditure, um, and so wouldn't uh, recommend that as a, a as a specific uh, course of action. The uh, with respect to uh, the, um, a seat at the negotiating table for for labour, I, I would say that you know as a province. Uh, and as the individual accounting officers and very much led by the Director General of the province, we play an active interest in maintaining a positive, constructive working relationship with the labor unions. Um, you know, the Department of Health, I think, has been a case in point there. Um, significant investment in, 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 in staff uh, and in engagement with the labor unions. In fact, this budget, uh, this adjustments budget itself, 
um, increases investment on medical staff health and welfare, uh, uh, health and wellness, uh, because we all understand what a um, very difficult time it has been for those staff. So it's not that the what what we, what we're saying is that we do a lot of interface with the labor unions and in, and in a management function. Um, at, at the provincial level, but when it comes to the question of wage negotiation, we curiously left out, um, and so this is not uh, this is not a, fun a fully functional framework for labour relations, given the the value we place on relationships with our staff um, in this uh, in this province. On the uh, thank you for the question on on data and particularly leveraging data in our supply chain management systems. These, as you know, are very, um, we, we use a range of legacy systems, uh, BAS, uh, Logis, um, and so forth that manage our, our, that are part of the overall management of our supply chains, um, and including what we have introduced at the provincial level, our e-procurement um, solution. We need to gradually, because these are large systems and some of them are legacy systems, is move them towards an integrated uh, system, but these are super tankers that you're steering, and so change takes uh, time. What we are hoping to do is to, um, it, it, and and the, of course, I should add that the intention was at national government level to to completely review the uh, information technology architecture through an integrated financial management system that has been significantly delayed. Um, the and. Um, yeah, one could have a whole discussion on that in its in, it, in its own right. So we want we know we must now in this environment accelerate our investment both uh, in that integration process, uh, and that's going to take quite a lot of effort. Um, we need to make sure that it is uh, uh, mature and risk aware enough to keep abreast of changes in the national environment as and when they do occur. And, and we want to make sure that we're not just doing a hardware deployment here. I think what we've done through the procurement disclosure report is to indicate how valuable it is to be able to surveil that data for business intelligence as well as for uh, um, uh, to, to, to spot more, any malfeasance, uh, malfeasance in our in our in our supply chains. Um, so we are very committed to that artificial intelligence deployment. Uh, around around uh, that as well. Uh, at the moment, our staff, and we have a very small team, um, highly competent, but a very small team in the provincial treasury that does this work. They're literally working through the, through the night, uh, aligning data across these big legacy systems. And we want to invest in those gaps uh, over, the, over the medium term. I would welcome an invitation from the committee for a much more detailed discussion um, on our supply chain management reform strategy. Um, I'm sure you will get as excited as I am by what the possibilities are to make every cent count uh, in, in our use of public uh, resources. Uh, let me hand over, I think, first to uh, Annalise Pick and then to, um, then to uh, Stephen Kenyon and then uh, Roy Harverman, if you wanted to add anything specifically on the compensation reductions question in terms of uh, unpacking the numbers uh, uh, in relation to the question that Honorable Dugmore had, uh, had requested support on, assistance on. Uh, so Annalise. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm going to deal with specifically the question that uh, Member Heron has asked. Um, and that is in relation to the difference in the numbers on the two dif on the two different slides. So let me first start with explaining the objective of each of the slides. Firstly, slide 27 explains how the adjustments budget is financed, so the different sources of revenue. That would be um, provincial equitable share from national, conditional grant allocations that come from national, as well as um, allocations that would come from the Provincial Revenue Fund and then also from own revenue collection from, uh, from departments. So that would be indicated in terms of how it's financed and our different sources. So in slide 27, the 865 million rand that we see is an increase in our provincial equitable share from national, is made up of the Presidential Employment Initiative Education um, for education of 814 million rand, and then also food relief for the Department of Social 
development of 51 million rand. And that's an increase, therefore, in our equitable share. Now, when we move to slide, to slide 32, which was also the member's question in terms of, of the, the jobs number. So let me start with, with in terms of what slide 32 indicates. Slide 32 now indicates all the allocations that is made in the adjustments budget. So the positives have been then divided into, so the positive allocations are therefore divided into the, our, our, our Western Cape recovery plan response in terms of job safety and well-being, but also in terms of those negative allocations in terms of reductions on compensation of employees and reductions in terms of our, of our own revenue collection and, as I indicated, the conditional grants. Those, so these are the total allocations, both pluses and minuses. So then when we look at the jobs um, figure that we see of 1.1 billion rand, which is made up of national, coming from national financing of 875 million rand. That national number is made up of the 814 million rand for education for the presidential employment initiative, and then also 61 million rand for the roads maintenance grant, which would also then go to a jobs allocation, and that would make up the 875 million um, rand on jobs in comparison to the different amount that is shown on slide 27. So, Chair, I think that, that takes care in terms of the, the questions that was asked by Member Heron from my side. Mr. Kenyon? Okay, let me come in there on the uh, Honourable Heron's question on slide 36. Um, the, the, around the, the bullet there that uh, referred to a decrease in provincial grant transfers reflecting uh, Western Cape government policy position and three-phase budget approach. Um, that uh, refers to the table on that slide, which shows the um, how municipalities are recognizing um, sources of funding for their infrastructure budgets um, and for their infrastructure spending that was achieved last year. So the, the decrease refers to the change between, so these are just provincial transfers that, that are for infrastructure, so it's a smaller number than, than you would have seen elsewhere um, on, on provincial transfers in total. Um, and the decrease is from last year's audited outcome to this year's original budget, which reflects um, changes in priorities within the departments. That's in the February budget. Um, but then the, the key part is that end of the, the, the bullet, which refers to the three-phase budget approach because then you see the increase um, between the original, the February budget of the, of the province uh, where we'd allocated 383 million here um, and it increases to 446 million in transfers. Um, and that's, that reflects what, what we were talking to in the subsequent slides um, with those additional allocations to a series of municipalities um, that increase so these only reflect the infrastructure. The, this table only, the slide only reflects the infrastructure, not some of the operational stuff. But um, obviously, with the roads, projects, public transport, etc., the additions um, in the uh, the adjustments in transfers to municipalities of just under a hundred million net um, help to to increase that number, which is part of that um, third phase of of allocating additional resources. Um, as part of the COVID response. Thank you. And Dr. Hoppeman, did you want to just touch on the compensation numbers again on the MTBPS preliminary framework? Yes, thank you very much, HG. Um, can, can you see my screen? I've just put up a, a different table from the MTBS document. Yes, thank you, we can see it. Okay, so what this table does is it combines the uh, one table uh, we presented, which was the changes to the provincial equitable share, uh, the additions um, and the adjustments, and then also adds and combines it with the table that I presented on the compensation um, reductions. So it sort of pulls it all together into one table. Um, and I just want to flag the 
uh, minister made the point that obviously the net reduction to the baseline is 25.2, which is this bottom right-hand number, which is the net reduction over three years. Um, in the third year, so in 2023-24, we had previously expected an amount of uh, 66 billion. Um, then there was has been an addition of 8.2 for for um, data app updates. So our expectation was 66.880. Uh, we now uh, expect 55159059. That's the bottom number there. So in the third year, there is a cut of 10.878690. So that relates to the, the um, cut in the third year. And then in addition, uh, there are uh, obviously the compensation cuts, which we did discuss in a little bit of detail. And these just put them together so that you can see the net effect of everything, how it all fits together. Um, there is obviously the, um, as I indicated, the wage freeze reductions relating to the 2018 year, which need to be pulled through throughout the MTA for 13 and a half. But then the new one, which relates to uh, the uh, an assumption relating to the uh, new agreement, which actually we don't have any sight of or uh, know where the progress is of that. Uh, our best estimate is that that would take out 10.2 billion of uh, compensation over the MTF. Uh, and then obviously there are other uh, reductions uh, over and above that. Um, so hopefully this helps with the question in terms of showing how this all fits together and how all the different changes to the provincial equity share come about. Uh, and also just highlighting obviously that cut of 10.8 in the third year, and then the total cut of 25.254, 25.3 billion over the MTA. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, I think Dr. Hoffman was the last person um, to answer questions. Colleagues, with that, I'm going to ask that any further questions that you may have, please be directed to the respective votes. And the budget in its respective votes will now be referred to the respective committees in order to deal with the votes in more detail. I would like to thank the Minister, the HOD and Team Finance for all the hard work that has gone into this and for assisting us and briefing us and, and explaining these, these concepts and uh, a lot of new financial terminology to us and also a lot of different financial models that we may not necessarily have, have approached in the Western Cape previously. It has been a very difficult budget, clearly. And colleagues, uh, just uh, for your information, I forgot to mention at the beginning of the meeting, the second quarter performance has not served before the cabinet yet, and thus we will receive a, a new date um, and time of that particular briefing. So please just keep an eye on your inboxes for when we're able to do that particular briefing. But colleagues, um, I would like to ask that you just stay online just so that we can um, consider the draft committee meetings for the 25th of November, please. But with that, um, I will um, uh, excuse the minister and HOD and team finance. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you so much. While um, while that happens, if our procedural officer can perhaps just put the minutes online for us. Thank you. So these are the minutes of the 25th of November, members. Um, thank you to Member McKenzie for acting on my behalf um, in this meeting as chair that time. Um, I, I was ill. I am mostly still ill, but um, thank you so much. Um, can we go down to page one, if everyone can just check their attendance. 
Are there any edits on page one members? If none, can we go to page two? Okay, consideration. Let's go down to point three on that same page. Okay, and then you have consideration number four. Colleagues, um, if there's a mover for these minutes. Honorable Philander, thank you. Yes, Chair. Thank you so much. Is there a seconder for these minutes? Going once, going twice. Okay, usually we have a seconder, but it is my understanding that in terms of the rules, only having one is sufficient. Oh, Honorable Mitchell. Second yet, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Mvimbi. Wonderful. Colleagues, are there any specific resolutions? And I refer to things that will not be dealt with with the respective votes and the respective committees. If none, then members, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much, and thank you for your patience with all the technical details today. Goodbye. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chair.